Hey, what's going on, everybody? What's going on? I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to drboystv.com, the home for intelligent black people. My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and uh, I'm glad to see you. Uh, shout out your name in, in the chat when you come in, the name of your city and everything else. Uh, and so uh, why am I doing this conversation today? Why am I having this um, interview? Uh, the reason I'm talking to the guests that we have today, our very, very, very special guest, Dr. Mary Stoddard, is because Mary is, uh, you know how you watch those Marvel movies and you see those superheroes on in the movies? Well, Mary's a real-life superhero. She, she and her husband uh, have uh, done some things that I have seen over the years where it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, wait a minute, I need to be talking about this because I don't know anybody else who's done what they've done. Mary Stoddard and her husband, um, and uh, and actually, what? To give me your husband's name, Mary, because I want to make sure. Marcus. What's that? Marcus. 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 Dr. Mary started, Stoddard and Dr. Marcus Stoddard um, produced five children, y'all. And I want y'all to pay attention here. Five children, three of them, uh, two, two have PhDs. One is finishing their PhD. Another one is an MD. And then the, la the, uh, the fifth one is a doctor of veterinary medicine. So basically five doctors, five, basically five doctors, y'all, in the same family. As you come in, I want you to give like a digital round of applause for that. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mary Stoddard uh, to the channel. How are you doing today, Mary? I'm doing great, boys. How are you doing? Doing very well, very well. And I see you you got all your books behind you. So you it's not just the kids that are out there getting busy. You're getting busy, too. Love <laughs> so, books. Nice. Books can take you to anywhere you want to go. I love it. I love, And, and you are, uh, are you practicing? You're, you're a practicing attorney. Is that kind of like your main, the main thing that you do? Is that correct? Yes, I am a practicing attorney, and I'm also a licensed registered dietitian as well. So I keep getting some questions or requests to help people with their diet. So sometimes I'll take some patients as well, but mostly practicing law. Wow. Okay. Mostly practicing law. All right. So, Mary, um, first thing I want to do, uh, you know, and, and my family's known your family for many years, and uh, and everybody, as you come in, you know, say hello to Dr. Stoddard and uh let them know how much you appreciate parents like this that are really doing the best for the children. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a believer that, you know, as I've seen the, the great things your family has done, I, I believe the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Right. So when I look at your children and uh, which basically you pretty much have five children that uh, have either become doctors or are on their way to becoming doctors. Again, I, I mentioned to everybody earlier, uh, two full PhDs. One, uh, Sean is about to actually be actually just got tenure, uh, a medical doctor, uh, another young young lady on her way to finish her PhD, a vet, a doctor of veterinary medicine as well. So pretty much five doctors, everybody. So I want everybody to know why I'm speaking to Mary. Um, at, when I see what your kids did, I look at the tree. I look at you and your husband, Marcus. But then I look at the tree that made the tree. And uh, mm -hmm. one thing I remember, and you can help fill in the void, the, the 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 gaps on this for me. I remember you telling me that. Am I for some reason the word like sharecropper comes into mind in terms of how you grew up and you and your was it eleven brothers and sisters that you had? There are seventeen of us. <laughs> okay, so so let let's start there, right? I need y'all to really hear this story. Please listen because this story this is the best. This is probably the most interesting part. The 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 what your children have done is to me just a continuation of an amazing legacy. Tell me about you and your seventeen brothers and sisters. How you grew up, what you accomplished, et cetera. I'm going to just be quiet and let you just say your thing. Well, we grew up on a farm sharecropping in Louisiana. And when you sharecrop, you don't necessarily own the land and you basically are farming for somebody else. Um, we were, you know, we would work the land that we had. Then we would go and work other people's land to make some money. Uh, but we grew a lot of our food, you know, we had, had cows and chickens and pigs and things like that, uh, gardens and large gardens to do vegetables and things like that. But we never really had to pay taxes. We didn't have any money. We were, in my mind, said, you know, my husband was raised partly in the projects. We were below the projects. And so, you know, we received commodities and, you know, uh, we made our clothes uh, from, you know, whatever material we could come up with. So we really didn't have the resources that a lot of people have nowadays. Uh, you know, we got the commodities, we got the food stamps, uh, but 
we also had the mom and dad in the house and mom always told us that you can do better than this and for them my parents finished with a ged uh neither one of them went to college um, nobody knew anything about college because living on a farm way back in the woods uh you kind of sheltered from the world and you kind of really don't know what's going on so my oldest sister who is, that has a different father she actually lived in the town and with us as well but she went to college first so she was my inspiration or our inspiration to know that hey we can do better than what mom and dad had the capability of doing dad went to the military was in the military for a while mom stayed on the farm and we worked the farm uh and you know most, most time we often joke that they had so many kids because they needed people to work the farm which was what we basically did <laughs> um running water we did you know we had a well water you know outhouse i mean it was primitive primitive type uh living but the one thing that really got us from what they are to where we are now is mom always saying you can always do better than this we didn't have the opportunity or she didn't have the opportunity back in those days they didn't have the opportunity to go to school and it wasn't until my youngest sister or youngest sibling graduated from college that mom or went to college that my mom decided to go back to college uh, or go to college and she actually started taking some classes she didn't finish you know she got sick uh, and she since has passed on but she started taking classes afterwards but I remember, and I think all of my siblings, what we did was we would pick up pecans to make money so the older siblings who had gone on to college could buy books and, you know, a coat or whatever they need to uh, pay the tuition or pay for the books that we needed in college. Um, and so we had to figure out how to do it. But we had that one inspiration from mom saying, you can always do better. And an older sibling who actually went to college and started that trend and everybody else just followed suit okay so let me ask you this so so let's 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 frame this uh for everybody who's coming in speaking with dr mary stoddard um okay so you uh you grew up uh pretty much uh sharecropping uh there were 17 of you but mm -hmm. right? you did not have a lot of money a lot of resources uh your parents didn't have a ton of education they had gds at the time uh, you had 17, you and your 17 siblings, uh, out of the 17, how many of y'all, uh, finished college? Well, they all went to college. We all went to college. Uh, one, the only one that does not have a college degree has a, well, he has a Bible college degree, but they all went to school, did some type of school past, uh, GED, past high school. So okay. everybody, everybody didn't, you know, we've got every kind of discipline in the family now uh that you can imagine you know most of them were engineers or computer experts um and so you know you, they're coming out working for exxon and ibm and you know really top-notch companies as well and eventually start their own business um so okay. that's pretty much All right yeah. so let me ask you this so okay so basically you're saying that out of 17 of you 16 of you got a college degree and then the, the 17th had a bible college degree so mm -hmm. basically now pay attention y'all this is what i want to summarize this to for everybody that's listening 17 children 17 college graduates because bible college is a college too right so mm -hmm. um that to me is amazing I, I i mean i want to i want to emphasize i want everybody to hear that because i remember that was one of the parts of the stories that i heard from uh, from my mother my mother would talk about you and she said, yeah, Mary grew up uh, without a lot of money uh, and they were literally sharecropping. And she had, I thought it was 12 siblings, but uh, 17 kids. And all well, we found some extra ones as, as the years have gone on. And so we count them. <laughs> wow. So, okay. So out of, the, out of the 17 you grew up with, uh, uh, do, do we have anybody that like that uh, maybe um, fell off the rails, went to went to jail, got in, in any any uh, serious problems, anything like that? You know, uh, got on drugs and nothing like that. Well, no, my if you met my mother, you would know that, <laughs> that was not an option. <laughs> I, I, I bring I bring that I bring that up because you know I think it's important for people to understand that 
that's um you know that's not a coincidence mm-hmm. and i think that's that's the point that, you know because i think the people think that you 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 know your family got lucky you know they look at your life and you and and dr stoddard and and y'all are not poor people i've been to your house you know and uh, and there are people that will walk by and say, oh, they must have got lucky or they, you know, somebody took care of them. And, and that's just not the case. So so you so so you have 17 children. And then here's the second thing I want you all to know about Dr. Stoddard that I thought was really amazing. Let's talk about you and what you did educationally. Now, you um, I know you have a law degree and mm-hmm. I assume you have like a master's degree. And uh, what, are, what are your credentials? Two masters. I have a bachelor's of science in food nutrition and clinical dietetics. I have an MBA. I have a master's of art and management. I have a Jewish doctorate, which is a law degree. And then I have a doctorate of education with the focus on leadership management. Okay. So, so five uh, degrees. Okay. So, all right. So law degree, master's degrees, uh, Two PhD. Masters. Okay. So, and, uh, and I remember, now tell me if this was true, but I think my sister might've mentioned that you, um, that you had that you 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 gave birth to one of your kids <laughs> and you know and i'm sure the doctors probably freaked out you you had to walk across the stage so you drove all the way 70 miles to lexington <laughs> what was it was it the next day to walk across the stage am i am i lying or tell help me fill in the blanks on that one okay so uh when i finished my mba i gave birth to i missed that graduation i gave birth to erica the one who is the md the, my youngest child, I gave birth. She was due the day I was supposed to graduate from law school. But it just so happens that, you know, it was a complicated pregnancy. The doctors decided that they were going to induce me on Thursday and graduation was on Saturday. So I was negotiating with the doctors to say, hey, you know, I, I can come back after graduation, but I want to be at the graduate. This is graduation from law school. You know, this is no joke. So, and, and at that time, I believe there was only a couple of blacks in the class. And so my determination was that they were going to see both of us walk across that stage. Uh, so that Thursday, the doctors actually did induce my labor and um, I delivered like Friday, early Friday morning. And, and uh, one of my sorority sisters, a pediatrician, I called and I said, look, I need to get to the graduation and I need you to come check this baby out so I can get out of here. And basically, she came that Saturday morning, and uh, I need to be out about 10 o'clock so I can make the graduation because it was in uh, Highland Heights at Northern Kentucky University. And mm. I did walk across the stage. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so that, that's, um, and that, that was, and that, and that was another thing when, when I heard that story, it kind of reflected kind of a, a general principle. It seems like you, you've lived by that and maybe grew up with, you know, that. Um, it, you know, that, that excuses are not necessarily something that's really in your vocabulary most of the time. Um, it sounds like you, uh, you, you built your family around principles that involve uh, accountability and just finding a way to get it done uh, because you, you came up in a space where there would have been a lot of excuses. You know, if any, you and any of your siblings had not been successful, it would have been easy to say, well, look at how I was born. Look at what I mm-hmm. went through, right? And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that sometimes we lose that. Uh, and we get caught up in maybe because we're, we were, we were black or because we were born poor, we think that that means we have no options. And and I, I just don't agree with that. And um, and so I'd be curious to know. Let me ask you this. So uh, there are a lot of parents that are watching that want to have successful kids like you. And uh, I'd be curious, I guess I'll start here and ask you when you observe the way kind of say an average parent parents, I don't think you and Marcus are average parents at all. Because, I mean, again, most, most people can't say I have, we went five for five, you know, in terms of five doctors. Um, uh, what do you see that you all do differently that maybe a lot of parents could learn from or a lot of parents don't do? Well, I think one of the th- most important things, and, and I'll, I'll hit on this after I talk about it, when you say excuses, excuses we see as opportunities. Uh, But one of the things that I think that parents can take away from this is that if you have an expectation for yourself, then you can require your kids to have an expectation for themselves. And my kids, I always instill upon them that I expected them to do more and bigger things than what we had done, Uh, because they were already at that stage is where we are. You know, they were already at the house that we live in. So my expectation was that they would do bigger and better things because you already have a foundation. 
but I think it's important. And I think one of the things that a lot of parents that I have, because I mentor other kids as well, I, one of the things that I see that a lot of parents fail to do is they fail to require the kids to have expectations and have those kids set those expectations. You know, I help my kids set their expectations, but I also had to be a model for them. I had to be a role model for them. I didn't allow my kids to pick role models off television. Uh, because those are people you cannot touch. Those are people that you can't pick up the phone and call and say somebody who's playing basketball or football, you can't pick them up, pick up the phone and call them and say, should I go to college or should I not go to college? But I'm here in the house with you. You can call me and we can have a conversation about that or we can sit down at the table and have a conversation about that. And, and, and as you know, I've mentored other people, like even your brother, uh, or your sister as well, mm -hmm. um, to help them get to the dreams that they have had as well. And a matter of fact, before this, I just talked with another young lady who, you know, she was in and out of college, but she graduated with her, got her PhD. She defended her dissertation yesterday, two days ago. Mm -hmm. And so the having an expectation or requiring your kids to have an expectation for life what are you going to do with this life that you have been given? Mm. And when you require that and you reinforce that and you also have an expectation because telling your kids to do something that you're not going to do is not going to get them where they, they have the potential of going. And the other thing is that you cannot require your kids to live the life that you forgot to live or you didn't get a chance to live. Mm -hmm. like you wanted to be you wanted to be a computer expert and now because you did, didn't go to college for that you took the easy way out or decided to do something else and you thinking oh well I should have really went on into computers or engineering you cannot pass that on to your kids unless that's something that they are designed to be um and, and I think your sister is a great example you can you can you know if you're designed to be a physician, then that's what you should do. No matter what roadblocks come up, no matter what, how many times you fall down, you get back up and you get back to doing what it is that you are going to really be happy with because that's what you're designed to be. And so mm -hmm. that was the expectation with my kids is that you are going to figure out what it is that you are designed to be, what it is that you want to be in life. What do you want to accomplish? Now, the where the where the part that I come in as a parent is keen observation of my kids, having conversations with my kids, looking at them, working with them, tutoring them, mentoring them, and seeing what it is that they really are talented at or they really have a knack for. My youngest, who just graduated from vet school, mm. we would literally be driving down the road. She see the animal on the side of the road and want to pick it up and take it to the vet. Now, wait a minute. Somebody's got to pay to take that thing <laughs> to the vet. So we're not going to take it to the vet. And she was just not, that was just traumatic for her. And so it, I had no doubt that her doing something as a vet, veterinarian or in veterinary medicine would be. Uh, the path that we would want to push her toward. Now, what happens next once you identify that is you figure out how to get them there hmm. with them. You help them figure out how to get there and what it's going to take. And her becoming a veterinarian is not something that I knew how to help her get to. So it required me to do research with her and for her and for her to do research with her and for her. And this starts in middle, in elementary school. You can't wait until they get to high school to help them figure out what they want to do. Because if we had to wait until she got to high school or until she got to college to try to figure out, she would not have probably not gotten into vet school because there are so many things that you have to have so many hours of actual veterinary contact to even apply to vet school which is the reason, probably the reason a lot of minorities don't get into vet school because they go and don't realize that you got to have all these things in order to do that. And so it requires me as the parent to do some research and have the child to do some research and help them do the research and then collaborate together on that. And that helps them get to where they want they want to go. 
Mm. Okay, so uh, so when you and by the way, everybody, if you just came in, I'm speaking with Dr. Mary Stoddard, and uh, she and her husband, Dr. Marcus Stoddard, uh, they raised five kids, and all five of them pretty much became doctors. Uh, one uh, is a veterinarian. Uh, three of them are PhDs and one is a medical doctor. And I thought that was just really extraordinary. And also, uh, in case you missed it earlier, Mary explained, uh, and you should rewind the video. She talked about uh, being raised with 17 siblings, pretty much as sharecroppers, uh, you know, very, very um, uh, uh, deep in the economic struggle. And all of them ended up graduating from college. I, I think right there, that's enough to just warrant an amazing life. Uh, so there's about three or four things uh, that's amazing about this family. So if you haven't done it yet, by the way, please hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up. Uh, also share this video. And I want you all to share this video because uh, because, Mary, you know, I tell you, um, I'm, I'm asking people watching to share this because there's so many people that are quick to just give us excuses for not getting what we want. You know, there's so many people that say, oh, well, because you're black you know, you're not supposed to do much of anything. And I, you know, or, or, or I remember even when I was at, um, at university of Kentucky and I wanted to do well academically, I wanted to make good grades. And I remember, uh, I remember even being told by one of the counselors that, um, that, you know, I should just be happy if I can get through my classes with C's and B's. And I remember saying, no, actually, I really want A's. I think I can make straight A's just like the white kids do. And she said, she said, well, that's impossible. I, I literally had two people tell me it's impossible to make straight A's. And I said, there's, there's people that do it. Like, what do you, what do you mean it's impossible? You know, and, and so sometimes that just those low expectations can mm -hmm. be the biggest curse that there is. And so you, you're, you're getting these, you know, you're jumping the bar and it's two inches off the ground and you're getting people cheering you on, acting like you did something amazing when really God meant for you to jump a much higher bar, but you never knew that existed because nobody ever set a standard for you. And I, I think that there are people who think, and I'd be curious to know what you think about this. I imagine there are people who probably think you're just some uppity lady you know, look at you. you look at you. You are, you are you a lawyer and a PhD. Your husband is a is a surgeon. And you just being uppity by setting these high standards and believing that we can all jump those standards. How do you deal? How do you respond with people like that? Because they don't know nothing about the fact that you grew up as a sharecropper. They just think that you were just born in the middle of all this privilege. How do you how do you kind of uh, deal with with that where people don't really want to sort of understand, you know, the, the necessity of doing the work? You know, I, one of the things that I've always told my kids is don't ever apologize for what you have accomplished because you were the one that was up at two, three or all night working to get to where you have gotten. So don't apologize to anybody for that. And we know that there will be individuals who will think that you're uppity or think that you, you know, because mom and dad was a lawyer, doctor, that you had all everything that you needed my kids never had everything that they needed. They never, you know, I remember my daughter coming home wanting some Nike tennis shoes. And I asked her, I said, well, who is Nike? And she said, well, I don't know. I said, well, when you find out who he is, ask him for some tennis shoes because you have your own name and you, you learn to love and respect your name. And so my kids never wore designer clothes. You know, we didn't wear the designer clothes. We didn't do that. You know, I raised them and to to understand that they were just as important as ever anybody else, but they were no more important than anybody else because everybody had the same opportunities if they wanted to take advantage of this. And and to give you an example of, of how that went, my daughter, my oldest daughter, when she went to college in Texas, one of her professors, she said, one of her professors asked her if she would ask her father to review his manuscript. Uh, because at the time, my husband was reviewing manuscripts for publications in journal, periodic journals, and she didn't understand why. And the professor said, do you really know who your father is? Now, my husband has worked very hard. He is the only one in his family that has a college degree. He has worked very hard coming out of the projects to get to where he is. And what it has caused is caused us to work together to help everybody get to their dreams, to get to their potentials. And so by raising them as, as everyday, ordinary people, it kept them grounded and it kept them understanding that I really have to work to get to where I want to go, to do what I need to do. They did not... Uh, make those accomplishments without failures you know they had challenges that they had to deal with as well um you know they they would have to uh you know go from one place to the next 
you know, and they didn't know who anybody there or they didn't know how to get there. But together, again, when you set those expectations for them, they will know, how, you know, they can figure out and we can figure out and you can figure out or they can figure out how to do that. So it wasn't so much as they were raised with a silver spoon because they did not. They were not. You know, they wash their own clothes, they did their own lard, they clean their own rooms, they cut their own grass, and we were able to save money so they can go to camp because they did those things. You know, I didn't have the housekeepers like some of the other doctors' wives who have housekeepers and you know everything everything is done for them. We just we didn't do that. We lived as everyday normal people because we knew the bigger picture was to get five kids through college without debt so that they can start at a level higher and that was the goal and we have successfully done that by the way dr stoddard can am i am i is it okay if i tell people about your husband a little bit yes. okay yes. i won't i promise i won't i won't reveal <laughs> any of his personal business but i think everybody needs to know this because I, I i don't want anybody to form an illusion that uh that you were just some single mom that you know not no disrespect to single moms of course but that you were a single mom who who just did it all by herself uh, let me look. This is Dr. Marcus Stoddard, and um, he's a professor of medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Uh, he's the director of non-invasive cardiology, uh, mm -hmm. the, the director of echocardiogra the echocardiography lab. Uh, he um, is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, the American Board of Cardiovascular D Disease, the National Board of Echocardiography. I've never heard that word before, but I'm trying to pronounce it right. Uh, he also has his, he went to medical school at Johns Hopkins University. And so, uh, so really when you're talking about, you know, everybody, we always talk a lot about black excellence and things like that, and just what that looks like. And whenever I think about black excellence, I think about your family first. Because uh, I, I I watched through the years. I've known Mary. Y'all don't may not know this, but I've known Mary and her family for probably thirty years now. And mm -hmm. uh, and I saw you help my sister get get into medical school. Uh, I saw you mentor my brother. And uh, and I I just watched all that happen, and I was so impressed by it. And it just came to me, you know. And I really think here's the thing, you know, a lot of kids they they know about their favorite rapper, they know about people on TV, but they need to know about people like you. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I really think that uh, that these models, you know, just the same way we learn other models of so-called success from how to get to the NBA or the NFL or how to become a entertainer or how to get a good job. I think these models of parenting success should also be studied so we can learn that we can do this. You know, mm -hmm. we, we 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 have it in our DNA. We have everything we need, you know, <laughs> and uh, and, I, and I don't want anybody walking around here thinking that just because you were born where you were born or born how you were born or who you are, you are, who you are, that that means that you're limited. There is no ceiling for you unless you choose that ceiling. So, so don't choose a ceiling. Fly like an eagle. So so without further ado, what I'm going to do is um, ask everybody, hit the thumbs up button. Uh, please share this video with other uh, parents that need to see this. And also, uh, I'm going to let Mary get the last word. Uh, Mary, so uh, if I'm watching and I'm a parent and I and I see people in the chat, like my friend Tierra K.J. Williams out of L.A., who has a daughter who's um, uh, very active and very talented. Uh, and I want I want I want that kind of success for my family, for my kids. What would be maybe one more uh, piece of advice? that we could take home that'll help us all just exceed at a higher level or succeed at a higher level? Well, I think one more piece of advice is do your research. You can't get to where you want to go if you don't know what's how to get there or you don't know what it takes to get there. And teach your kids delayed gratification. Uh, because if they understand delayed gratification, they can understand that they have to do the work, but and regardless of what their friends are doing, that if they do the work, put in the work now, they'll be able to to do whatever it is that they want to do later on in life. And 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 by all means, required parents have a responsibility and an obligation to determine who their kids hang out with and don't hang out with uh, in life, especially at the young age, because inviting people over to your house is your house. You don't have to invite everybody over to your house and they don't have to go to everybody's birthday party. And so parents need to guard their children and who is putting ingredients into their children to produce them as to what they can potentially be. And so 
Uh, one of the things that I'm doing, and I'll put this plug in there, one of the things that I'm doing, uh, Dr. Watkins, is, is uh, a lot of people have asked me, how did I do this? How did I have produced five? Or as Serena says, she's Dr. Stoddard number six now. Uh, I am writing that book now. And so it will probably be out next year. Uh, and some of the things that I've talked about is how you can get your help your kids to achieve and go to school, come out debt free and do all these great things that they have the great potential of doing. Wow. I was just about to say that. I saw people in the chat saying you need to write a book. And I was going to ask am. you, because you already you already work, work like crazy. So I said, you might as well get a book in there, too. You know, a book, a training manual, teach a class. I mean, I, I just really think this is, you know, when I think about education, um, mm -hmm. I think education that at least as I got older, <clears throat> the more education I got, the more I realized that anything I get educated on needs to be centered around things I'm going to need and things mm -hmm. I, I want to accomplish. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of the stuff we learn in school, we don't even use it anymore. Uh, but, mm -hmm. the, the you know, but when you talk about playing this game of life, where you're trying to find happiness and fulfillment and peace and success and wealth, or whatever it is you're trying to do, you got to go talk to the right people, you know? Exactly. So uh, I want to say thank you to Professor Stoddard, who is, uh, who's definitely been a, a great teacher to me throughout the years. And I have so much respect and appreciation for you and Dr. Stoddard and, and all your children. And, uh, and I, I've, I've seen them over the years. They're probably all big and grown now. They probably scared me if I saw them today because I haven't seen them in a few years. But but I've been following this story, and I'm going to tell you, everybody, uh, look up the Stoddard family. Uh, Mary Stoddard is uh, also a practicing attorney in Louisville, Kentucky. By the way, Mary, do you have like a website or something like that where people can reach out to you? Yes, I'm on the website, www.stoddard at mstoddard at stoddard-associates.com. M. Stoddard at, at Stoddard. Okay, dash associates. Dash .com. Okay, I'm gonna put it up on the screen and I'd like to ask you, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, just get ready for your inbox to get flooded. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, again, another thing also that I think is very key is that in helping my kids to achieve what they achieve, you have to help others at the same time. It cannot just be about you and your kids. It has to be about you because the more you give, the more you're able to receive. And, it, you know, you, you it, it's an outlet for you. But, you know, just like helping your your siblings and helping other and, and the young lady who finished her Ph.D. a couple of days ago, you know, that young lady, I've been raising her since she was they moved to Louisville. Her mother died in the in the move. And so, mm. you know, I played mom for them. Uh, and so, and, and you know them, the Smith, she is, she finished her PhD and I'm so proud of her, uh, that she continued on. Um, wow. and, um, you know, and, you know, they had struggles, but you got to help somebody else. You, you know, you can put it all into your kids. Uh, and, and, and I've seen situations where they put all it into their child, but never helped anybody else. Mm. And it didn't really produce the outcome that they wanted. Well, you know what? I think what you're saying, it's funny, Mary, that you mentioned this because um, I, I wrote, I, I'd written a little short little book a long time ago uh, that people can probably find it on Amazon. And it was called It Takes a Village to Raise the Bar. Mm -hmm. And basically one of the points that, that I made in the book is that, um, you know, I, I, I see all, all the children, any, any child that's in my space, in my mind for that moment, for that time, that's my child. You know, and I feel like a, a strong community is built around not just, you know, skills, knowledge and resources, but the best, most important resource you can have is love, you know, love yeah. for each other. And and the fact that you love that mm -hmm. child enough to say, OK, you, you know, you, you, your, your mom went to heaven, but I, I'm going to be your mama on earth like that. Mm -hmm. To me, that speaks volumes and, and kind of goes beyond just, you know, the fact that you are successful and everything else. It's. It's that extra coding of, of, of really, I think I almost consider it to be like God's superpower when you have that kind of love and you understand the assignment at that level, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm in a complete alignment with you. I, I have scooped up kids <laughs> left and right all through my journey, not because I was trying to be some wonderful person, but because I thought I'm like, wait, ain't that what you're supposed to do? You know, yes. it, it, you know, it, it just it, it baffles me. It, it almost it baffles me. Sometimes it, it makes me a little sad when mm -hmm. 
I see people that are like, oh, well, well, those ain't my kids. I don't care nothing about them kids, you know? And I'm kind of mm-hmm. like, wow, like these are children in your community. Like you should care. And by the way, everybody, there's the book right there. If you ever wanted to take a look at it, it's called It Takes a Village to Raise the Bar. It's very short though. It's a very short book, but, it, okay. but it's built on uh, the four things I believe that our community needs to be strong, which is wealth, education, family, and community. And, mm-hmm. um, and I wrote it about maybe 10 years ago. And uh, and I just tell you, I, I love that. So, I, you know, I think that um, because, you know, what it makes me think about, too, is after slavery, when you had all these um, former slaves, you know, just literally getting an old building and a few books and they educated kids better than some of these school systems can yes. do today. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like I, I just believe that a good good mom, a good daddy figure good, or whoever that loves you can educate you better. <laughs> than some teacher who does not even know you. And that, and I know that from my own experience, because you know, I didn't do well in school. And the reason I didn't realize till I got older, the reason I didn't do well in school was because I didn't feel any love around me. I felt like I was in a penitentiary. <laughs> but, but every time, Mary, every time I got around somebody that I knew cared about me, I always did well because I wanted to do well for them. I, you know, I felt a connection there, you know, and I think we have to talk about these things when it comes to educating. Because I don't know if you know this, Mary, but in Chicago where I live, they, did you know they have 55 public schools in Chicago wow. where, where they don't have one single child who can read or do math at grade level? Wow. Yeah, 55 now, schools. So let me interject this because it, having that many schools and that many kids not being able to do it, you got to put some of that weight on the parents mm-hmm. because the one thing that I refuse to do is turn my children over for somebody else to educate them. Mom, dad, somebody needs to be checking that child's homework, even if you don't understand the math yourself. I mean, if, if it was if it was some error that I didn't understand or I didn't remember, I'd look it up, YouTube it. You can figure out, figure it out and figure it out with the child or even have the child think you're trying to figure it out so that they will work hard to get it. Uh, yes. I would would oftentimes ask the the principal for the books that this, my kids were going to use the next year, because they were not going to sit during the summer and do nothing because kids lose too much knowledge. So, parents, mom, dad, somebody in the family needs to take responsibility of teaching that child or training that child. And it doesn't matter what kind of education that you have. You know, there are things that you can do as, you know, like communication, writing skills. I would take my kids to the zoo and the one, especially the one who wanted to be a veterinarian. Okay, so go pick out an animal and I need you to do a report for me on that animal. Mm. Mm. That's what they did. They had summer school at home. You know, I, I worked myself or was in school and working. But they also had summer school. You know, they didn't sit at home and do nothing. There was a whole, whole itinerary for them to do, and you have you had the older ones help the younger ones because I would have them. Okay, now you need to grade these papers for me, and would have them grade the papers, and then I reviewed review the papers, and it wouldn't just be my kids. I'd have the the two young ladies that I was helping their father raise them, and 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 my nieces would come and it would help them as well. Um, and so you're right. That's that village. But mm-hmm. we should not turn our kids over to expect the school to be the only mm-hmm. to be the primary or the only facet in teaching them. And so, yes. you know, I, I don't want to say it, but I fought those parents because you can go to the library. We you, we didn't have the library. We went use a thing called the bookmobile. <laughs> I remember that. The bookmobile would come by every two weeks. And we would check out books and we would read. That's how we got books. We didn't have because we didn't have transportation to go to the library. Wow. Well, you know what? I I, I just I just love that. You know, I, I just love, you know, uh, I, I just love seeing when we come up with solutions that involve something other than just, you know, complaining about what other people are not doing for us. You know, mm-hmm. so um, so God bless you, Mary. I, I, I'm, I'm so proud of, of your family and what you've accomplished. And uh, I hope everybody that's watching will share this uh, conversation with others. Uh, in fact, uh, Mary, I'm going to go and openly let you know that uh, I'm going to reach out to you because I would like to invite you to our convention. I hope that you and or Dr. Stoddard can make it. Uh, I, I will cre- we'll make a panel and put you all on it because I, I really think 
that uh, that this is you know in my mind you all my are my heroes and I and I, I want other people to hear from you as well so um, so uh, thank you all everybody for watching uh, this is Dr Mary Stoddard. Uh, her, her husband is Dr. Marcus Stoddard and uh, Mary's email address. She's a lawyer, uh, an attorney in Louisville, Kentucky. Her um, email address is mstoddard at stoddard-associates.com. It's right there on the screen. And uh, also me, uh, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins. And my new book is called The Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power. You can pick that up at Amazon. And in addition to that, if you'd like to join us at the All Black National Convention, it's going to be in Atlanta, October 20th. It's all about uh, black excellence, particularly in those areas of uh, wealth, education, family, and community. So if you'd like to join us, just go to allblacknationalconvention.com or you can go to my website, boycewalkins.com. So thank you all very much. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out. And Mary, uh, just hang on for one second. I'm going to talk to you off camera. And uh, okay. you all have a wonderful day. God bless you. Bye-bye. God bless you all.